Hello, and welcome to today's uh, webinar on digital marketing. And um, I just want to introduce the image behind me, uh, which was directed by Pete Ingram and Aidan Kempster. And um, uh, also a team to build it, including myself. So this is uh, a lot of pre-prep work and then three weeks build and about 40 minutes demolition. Now, the, this, this one webinar is also part of a, a group of webinars on strategy. So I'll be jumping between different things that I talked about previously or um, so you can refer to previous webinars um, because digital marketing uh, on itself just doesn't sit by itself. It's part of a whole cluster of strategy and content and that sort of thing. So the whole uh, basics of uh, digital marketing is to get your message in front of people. So that's the thing that we'll be exploring today is simply getting your message in front of people using digital formats. Um, now, before I go into any more detail on that, it's really important strategy, strategy, strategy. Um, digital marketing, can be an endless cycle of burning resources and um, burning resources, time, um, all that sort of stuff. So you're really gonna be very strategic with the time that you're um, spending on this and um, the, the approaches that you're doing. So we've uh, had some previous webinars on strategy. Uh, so I recommend you give them a quick look. Uh, the, the videos are posted to YouTube. Uh, and then I'm also going to go through something that I went um, through with earlier um, early webinars. Let me just share screen through this again. Uh, so the idea of is to get people to, to move along the um, journey. And then we've also got um, the same diagram that's uh, in another format. So all the, um, the things on the outside this is what we'd call marketing. So in this diagram, we've got a mix of digital marketing, such as social media, email. And then we've also got offline um, marketing, such as letterboxing, et cetera. And in this diagram, the marketing is on the left. So we're going to be looking at uh, the left side of this diagram today. However, it doesn't sit in an, on its own. There's no point getting uh, the attention of someone if you're not then going to go move them through to the, the next, no, next um, level. We go. So I'm just running, I'm just talking off the um, run sheet, which was emailed to you. Uh, if you don't, uh, if you've lost that, if you just go to actionskills.co webinars, digital marketing, you'll get to this run sheet. So um, you can also refer that uh, in the future, which will help support the videos. And it's also got the links to the references that I'm working on. Okay, so the first step in the user journey, and then we, um, we want to get them in the database, then we want to communicate with them. The other thing with, my, um, with digital marketing that's really important concept to understand is that you need to hit people with multiple touch points. So in that context, they'll see you multiple times. Uh, there's different numbers being thrown around. The uh, eight is a common one, which used to be more like four. So in that context, they may see a blog post, they may see um, a post on Facebook, they may see someone talking about it. And then they, it takes that before they um, will actually take action. So it's important to um, think about digital marketing is it's just not one thing that you're putting out to try to connect to people. It's always a multiple, it's more of a system or a framework that you're going to build. So you're gonna be building a marketing publishing engine, um, which you're constantly feeding which will then um, sometimes will give you short-term results, but a lot of this is also building long-term results. Okay. Now, the other key point about marketing to understand is that content is king, is a um, saying. So I like to say content um, is king and queen, um, but it's also the princess. I mean, content is everything. So for example, if you're trying to build your Instagram profile, if you don't have Instagram photos, um, if you don't have good content, you're not going to be um, doing, you're not going to be building your Instagram. Same thing with your emails, your website needs content. Um, so, and we'll be doing um, a content webinar soon. We will be doing one on actual content. 
called Kings and Queens of Content, where we run through um, different approaches. And then we've got one that's just about images and focusing on um, imagery within digital marketing, because images are, are so key. The other uh, really important point to um, think about with digital marketing is that you must learn about your community. They're the people that you're trying to talk to. And we've, we, in previous webinars, we've talked about um, how to target your audience and to define them and start looking at your audience. Uh, and it's really important to see what mediums they're using, how they're using it, what's the culture. So if you want to actually connect with them um, where they are in a digital context, you need to actually start learning about where they are, what that means, um, what are the social norms about marketing, those sort of things. So that's the introduction. Okay, so there's a few approaches to digital marketing and pretty much the lion's share of digital marketing is search and social media. Uh, and I'll go through a lot of other ways because again, depending on your target audience and, and what, how you're trying to connect with them. So search is search engines. Google is the most common, but there are quite a lot of other search engines. And this is the most effective form of marketing. This is because someone is searching for this. So it might be um, donate uh, Gippsland forests. They've searched that in. So at that point, they are ready to, to donate to a campaign on Gippsland's forest. So if you can get that um, link to your Gippsland forest campaign, then you're more likely to get a donation. The, the problem with um, that is that it's limited. Um, there's a limited amount of people that are searching for that. So you, even if you get 100% of all the people that search for those terms, there's only a small amount of people that are searching for those terms. So you then also want to then invest in social media, which will create more leads, although the leads in social media are much weaker. Um, and there's two types of search. One is organic. And what organic means in a Google, so I'll share screen. Okay, so at the top here, you can see it's got ad, 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 and then we've got without the ad. So the, the ones with the ads next to it, they are what we call paid search. And the one down below here is what's called organic. So this, this page here is what Google thinks is the most important page for you. So Google and other search um, engines are optimized for you. So in theory, it's the best web page on the planet. However, it's the best web page on the internet for you. Whereas these ads um, are also optimized for you, but it's also just targeting um, people paying to be there. Now, social media also has um, organic and paid concept. Uh, it's a lot less um, easier to show visually, uh, but the idea is that posts which uh, people want to see. So generally Facebook um, will want pictures of you personally. So if you're sharing your emotions, photos of your children, um, this more family, wholesome, um, emotional stuff is what shares the most. So if you're posting something like that, then Facebook will actually push that out a lot more um, versus uh, if you're doing just more like, you know, marketing, uh, digital marketing webinar ad, um, that's going to go less um, through um, social media. So the, the organics are also quite corrupted because they have a lot of algorithms which are working out this, um, what is relevant, what will share, what people react to. So in that context, when you're um, working in social media, it's always a learning process, like putting um, posts out and then seeing what um, will share and what is going around. And then obviously you can pay for your social media um, ads. Now it's really important if you're paying for your social media ads is to um, look at what medium you're um, sending to. And again, your target audience, all those sort of things. So for example, if you um, pay for an ad in Facebook, it will want to automatically take that ad and put it into Instagram. That to me is just, uh, it's not very smart because Instagram is a completely different medium and communicates a different way than what Facebook does. So you'd really want to optimize a page uh, ad for Facebook and then push that through Facebook, then create a custom ad for Instagram and push that through Instagram. I mean, if you're spending all this time and money, you at least want it to work through the medium. Um, 
and social media also um, the organic reach is also different depending on the platforms like um, Instagram is is different again to say Pinterest to LinkedIn that sort of thing okay so Facebook um, and the reason I'm talking about Facebook a little bit more than other um, platforms is that Facebook is pretty much the dominant social media for everything the majority I think it's about 80% of the world's mark advertising dollars so this is money that Murdoch used to make on selling on newspapers and TV and uh, TV ads this is now going to Google and Facebook 80% of ad revenue so Google and Facebook have actually completely shifted to advertising model now the problem with that is that they're not paying for content somebody else is someone else is whereas at least Murdoch and um, the television stations were actually paying for content but that's a different discussion um, so there's two ways of uh, looking at Facebook um, one is pages and groups now I'm sure you've looked at both of those so pages are more for a, um, a brand or an individual which is showing um, which is more of a broadcast way of looking at things so I'm, I'm broadcasting on my Glenn Todd page or my action skills page I'm broadcasting stuff about what I'm doing and what Action Skills is doing. And in that context, I'm still trying to generate conversation and discussion. With um, groups, groups are more a collaborative approach where people are um, discussing stuff within groups. Um, and so in that context, depending on your type of marketing, your type of content is which approach you would have. So Action Skills, we're currently just running a page. Um, but we will um, set up a group sooner or later, which will be um, a group where people can come in and ask questions about um, social media, I mean, social media marketing, all this digital stuff. So in that context, it's um, everybody can go in and help each other. And then the marketing that we get is just purely from like managing that and, and looking after that. The, the, the other thing with um, Facebook and social media is it's heavily targeted. You can target very specific um, people, their interests, their um, what they like. So, for example, if you're running a Facebook ad, um, and I recommend that when Facebook asks you to boost a post, that you don't do that. You stop and actually create a Facebook ad and push that out. Is that you could actually say that I want to target people who like Greenpeace Australia, who are who are 50, who are female, that live in Coburg. So it's very targeted in how you can target people for advertising. Now, in saying that, it's very weak leads. Um, if you think about yourself when you're scrolling through Facebook, you don't really want to be looking at ads. So unless that ad is really good or is really relevant to you, then you're not going to look at it. So in that context, you're not the leads that that um, that will come through social media are quite weak. So in that case, you've got to then do a very um, well executed content. Um, presented well and then a good call to action to get them back to your website to then continue that journey versus if you're in Google they're already keen to go somewhere the other um, thing with uh, social media um, uh, promotion is that people don't want to leave their Facebook if they're in there so if there's an ad unless it's really interesting they're not going to jump out whereas if you go to Google you're actually going to Google to jump to somewhere else okay um, any questions? Um, it's difficult to create a mountain of content needed. Okay, so there's a question about uh, content. Um, and now I've got a whole webinar on content, so I'm not going to answer that question because I will um, talk about how to, ways to produce content in the actual content um, webinar. Okay, so other types of um, digital marketing, um, and this, this still links into social media, is influencer. Now you would have heard um, that as a really um, fancy marketing term recently and especially with the COVID environment where a lot of influencers are no longer being able to um, continue their work to become influencers. So when I talk about influencers though, I talk about it in a new way of thinking and also think of it an old way of thinking. So a new way of thinking is um, when we think about Instagram, bloggers, newsletters, um, or people have influential sites. So these are people who are writing, writing quality content regularly, building up a following, um, and that following is quite connected to them. Um, 
Also, when you're looking at influencers, it's also interesting to look at a concept called micro influencers. So this is um, people that have a smaller um, audience. However, just say that you had um, $10,000 to spend on a influencer. You could spend that on one fancy influencer that has a massive reach, or you could say, right, well, I'm gonna distribute that to $500 to 20 influencers, which is smaller, which have smaller audiences. Um, and that can be an, an effective campaign uh, way of approaching it as well, especially because the big influencers are going to be a bit more cheesy and the audience may or may not resonate with this on the constant advertising. Whereas if you've got micro influencers, they're more likely to be targeted and not, and not advertising that much. So it can be more effective. And, and on a not-for-profit context, um, there's paid influencers, but then there's also a lot of people that may be really into your cause. So in that context, if you can um, start building up lists of people who may be interested in your cause, that are, um, have building a following, so then figuring out how you can work with them to, um, you know, for them to influence your campaigns. And I also will put in old school influencers, um, Rupert Murdoch, for example, who has uh, owns a lot of newspaper, TV, that sort of stuff. So in that context, I would still put digital under digital marketing, sending a press release to the traditional media because the traditional media these days is mostly online anyway. So if you can then get your get an article or a journalist to cover your story in traditional media, then that's a um, a great form of marketing as well. And then the old fashioned celebrity, and um, we're still in a celebrity culture. So this links into new school um, influencers because a celebrity may have a, a massive Instagram following, for example, so they would fit into that the new school, but some, some celebrities may not have any sort of social media or much social media, in which case that'd be a great opportunity for you to um, push out their messaging about your campaign actually on your platforms and then use their celebrity to builds but i'm sure everyone understands celebrity so i'll leave it at that <laughs> i love your smile thank you um okay so i've talked uh, introduced um by talking about how important content is and i'll be doing two whole sessions just on content um but content in itself is marketing uh, and there's a few approaches to this. Um, in addition to content that's fueling your website, that's fueling your social media, that's fueling your newsletters and your YouTube channel. Um, one approach is that's made very um, big by Red Bull is actually just paying to produce good content. So in the old days, you'd have a network or um, a production company that would then produce say an extreme sports. Um, I saw a great one where people were jumping out of planes in those suits and they fly. Um, so whereas in this context now, Red Bull is actually becoming that company that's producing it. So they're paying for the videographers, they're paying for the talent, they're paying for, the, for all the expenses. So they actually produced that video. Um, and then it's branded within it, but not over the top. So that you'll probably see them drinking Red Bull here and there and the logos here and there, but it's not like, it's not an ad. They're not pushing, you should drink Red Bull like in a um, Coca-Cola ad. It's just subtle, just enough so people know this is Red Bull content. Um, now, then they put that through their own channels. Um, they may do a um, syndication, say with MTV or something like that, where MTV will get free content they can sell advertising off, so they'll push it or they can just push it through their own channels. Because it's quality content, people want to watch it. Um, so that's an, an expensive approach. Um, in saying that though, with not-for-profits, if we're creative, we can also um, think of some, some really good content that we can produce at a more realistic budget than um, Red Bull. User content. So this is where people produce content for you. Um, this generally works better, obviously, for bigger campaigns. Um, but this can also be facilitated by actually running competitions and things like that. So, for example, the Bob Brown Foundation run an um, event called Tarquine in Motion, which I recommend if you're creative. Um, so, basically, around uh, Easter time, they um, facilitate, I think, 100 artists to go to the Tarquine. And then the artists then explore creative expression around the Tarkai to show how, how special and beautiful it is. So that then creates an event um, to, to get 
get awareness to the um, Tarkai. It also connects with the artists so that um, they're building the campaign that way. Uh, but more importantly, then they're building good content. And so all that content um, from the, um, those expeditions are then being able to push out. Um, in my opinion, they focus too much on um, offline um, promotion to running exhibitions and things. I'd like to see them actually putting that content much more in the fore in a digital context and actually starting to push that content. Um, but in, the, in that um, example, they're, they're, they're organizing the framework, they're organizing the activist camps, they're getting people to where they're going on organizing it, but it's actually the users that are producing all the content. So there is still a cost to Bob Brown Foundation, but it's a very low cost to, um, compared to the huge results they're coming back. Other ways of looking at content is content syndication. So this is where your someone else is pushing out your content. So for example, if you're going to write a blog post on um, the stupidity of, of the logging industry as far as their financial, um, the way they operate financially, you may then write a, a really well-researched long piece on, on that subject and put it onto a website. Whereas your website gets really low traffic. Whereas you may then find um, a media channel, somebody who's running a very influential blog, or um, a mainstream news um, channel or some of the newer ones like Conversation um, or Karaki and say, look, I'm going to, I've produced this quality content. I'll give you exclusive use of this content. In addition to my website, I'll put on my website as well. So they go, great, free content. Now, if you've written quality content, they'll like, I get free content to then put advertising on and then pump it through my website and then you get to access their audience. So if they've got a large audience, that's a far larger audience than you ever would have had on your website. And of course, you'd also have a link back to your website and back to your campaign. So when you think about producing written content or other forms of content for your website, think about actually, would this be on a better platform? Was there another platform that this fits um, better as a primary um, way to push out your um, content? And then of course, you still put it on your website for the for the main reasons that you work. Uh, also, ebooks are becoming quite um, popular, and in that context, then you can use the if you're writing an ebook. So you might write an ebook on um, the finance, the finances of the logging industry, as an example. So in that context, you can then use the ebook um, infrastructures that are out there, or the different distribution channels that are um, that are distributing ebooks. That would be another channel to get your content out there. So one way of looking at it is like, I need to produce content and then also how do I get that content to as many eyeballs as possible? And then of course you've got your strategy in place. So then once you've got the content to the eyeballs, how do you get them, the eyeballs to then to the next level? Uh, one method of uh, digital marketing and one that I'm not familiar with um, is in-game uh, advertising. So I gave up playing video games when I became a web developer or also stare at this screen uh, more than I do. Um, but apparently the way it works is that if you're playing a game, um, inside that game is advertising. So that if your target audience is gamers or a certain demographic that are gamers, then that makes sense to actually get inside the game. And if you're strategic about it, you may look at the game's actual um, narrative and the actual stages of the game or the actual things that the people are doing at that time in the game and then work out how that would link in a, in a real sophisticated way to your campaign and then you could place that advertisement not just as a flashy dumb ad but actually something that's relevant to the to the game the another form of um digital marketing is sponsorship and that will come in a few ways in that context, when we were talking about um, network mapping in a previous webinar, looking at your communities or your forums that are influential, in which case you would then sponsor them. So that might be sponsor the running of, a, um, of an online forum or a Facebook group or something, um, or maybe it's the sponsoring of content, um, et cetera, et cetera. So in that context, you're looking at something that strategically um, works with your campaign. 
Um, so again, with a, with a forestry campaign, there may be an event or um, something that's, that's actually working for the same values and the same goals that you are. And then you may use some of your refuge stream to support them, which is directly supporting your aims, but then um, allows you to um, get more diversity in your campaign and then grow your campaign off that. Um, good old fashioned merchandise. This is probably offline, um, but I think it's quite important to, um, to push there. If you can afford um, printing, then um, merchandise is great, especially if you're, you're, we jump back to influencers. If you've got a celebrity that's wearing your t-shirt while giving an interview on the forest, um, it's a great way to get your messaging out there. Um, so there's new um, processes such as um, Redbubble, which allow you to print on demand. So when we did the pine, closed Pine Gap protest, we um, set up a heap of different graphics like t-shirts and um, flags and banners and those sort of things. We, had, uh, we didn't set any profit margin on it, so it was just cost to produce. And so then people could come along, don't, um, download the shirts, download the banners and all those sort of things. And then, then um, that was helping grow our campaign because um, when you saw pictures of the campaign, when we were then later doing our marketing during the actual protest, then we looked a lot more professional and looked a lot more sharp. Uh, and then also like when I'm wearing my t-shirt around since then, people are asking me, you know, what is this um, Pine Gap thing? And then that's a great conversation starter. Uh, so you can run a whole merchandise line without spending a cent. Um, and Redbubble's one of them. Um, there are a few of them out there. The main problem with that is that it's harder to source an ethical um, approach to producing your, your merchandise. In saying that though, it's also print on demand. So you're also reducing wastage there as well. So. Um, okay, so another form of marketing is affiliate. So affiliate marketing um, in a digital context could be, say if I'm selling a software, uh, well just say I'm selling, just say I was selling these webinars as a paid version and say it was a hundred bucks to access them. And so I could do an affiliate program where anyone that signed up, somebody to my um, webinar training would then get $5. And so then they'd go, oh, well, if I, if I sell a lot of these, I can make a lot of money. So then they, they start then running their own campaigns, their own marketing. Um, I spoke to an affiliate marketer, professional affiliate marketer, and the way that they tend to work is they'll be running on 50, 100 products at a time. Um, and they will um, get a little bit from each one. They have lots of products and it just trickles in to become an income. Um, now for not-for-profits, then, uh, uh, a application of this concept is called distributive fundraising. So there's a few uh, CRMs or client relationship managers. So they're the fundraising software that you use to that allow users to then run their own um, fundraising campaign. So you might be running a campaign for, you know, your annual um, fundraiser for the Save the Gippsland Forest campaign. So in that case, you could then ask all of your support or your keen supporters to then run their own fundraising campaign that then fits, fits through. So then they can then use their personal connections and say, look, I'm raising money for the forest. Um, and then you can see the numbers that they're doing. So that's a sort of a not-for-profit uh, um, application to affiliate marketing. And I'm sure you can think of some other examples if you um, think about it. And another form of digital marketing. I've got this right at the bottom, which is ad placement and pay per click. And I would not recommend this as a method. Um, and it's also been shown to be quite fraudulent. So this is um, where the digital marketing industry tried to replicate the traditional advertising model. So, you know, a newspaper, you've got an ad there. Um, so they're like, well, we've got a web page, we'll put an ad there. Now, and then they go, we'll make this better because we'll only charge people when somebody clicks on it. Um, now, what's been proven is there's been so many robots that just click on those ads. The data coming back of who clicked on it is actually, um, it's just not relevant. So I'd be looking at the data with skepticism and I think that ad placement is just um, not a good approach. Uh, you know, affiliate marketing is far better approach because that way you can actually see, see what's happening there. Um, and they've got a genuine audience. 
that placement may be useful if you can game the system, maybe if you can get more targeted. So there might be a certain website that has advertising that you're campaigning on, or maybe they're sponsored by someone, and then you can maybe able to run a website sort of um, highlighting how crap they are. So you may, if, you've, if you can target your ads, you may be able to use it in some way like that. In that case, it's not the advertising, nor the paper clicks you're interested in, you're just more, um, you know, actually protesting their site using the advertising system. Okay, do we have any questions? Um, example of merch, training seminars. Okay, cool. I was just reading the chat. Whew. All right, so um, so these are the uh, the different approaches that you you run for social media, and I do recommend that search is your primary. So do the work to get your search, and um, we'll be doing search tomorrow. So to get your search um, ranking, um, generally search is, search is an ongoing thing, but it can also be a bit of set and forget. So that way you can um, get that in place. Then the next phase is social media. Um, and start building your campaign through that. Um, and then the rest of the stuff can sort of dovetail into that. And, and again, um, I will <laughs> emphasize strategy. You've got limited resources. And also some people go, well, I don't have time to digital ma market and our team are too busy trying to save the forest. We, we don't have. So in that case, just start. Um, start doing some basics. Um, then once you've got a basic framework, then you can then recruit, um, look for volunteers within your community, people who then may be able to help you and then working on building that digital media team. Um, but there is very strong statistics showing a correlation between effective social media um, and actually now connecting, um, building campaigns in a more um, contemporary context. Um, and I'd say, especially now in COVID because offline organizing has obviously um, been minimized. Okay, so now I'm going to talk about homework for you. Um, digital marketing is a massive, um, massive um, area. And what I'm trying to do with my webinars is to um, grab all my experience, my research, and then distill it into a more of a layman's term, simple framework that people can get started. Or if they just do a, get a few points and just start on that. So um, once you've um, gone beyond what I've, what I've spoken to you about, then I'd really recommend you do your own research. And I've just got this whole section to start you on that journey. Um, as a digital marketer, it's something that changes quite fast. Um, some basics will stay the same. Uh, so you really got to always be um, paying attention to seeing what's happening. Um, every now and then, dip back in, do intensive research. So the way that I do is I'll, every period, six months, a year sometimes depending on what I'm doing I'll then do intensive research on what's happening in marketing at the time um, so that I can just keep my skills going now I'm going to talk about mainstream marketing versus activist marketing and I don't think there is any versus I think it's exactly the same because mainstream is trying to sell an idea or sell a product and activism is trying to sell an idea or sell an action it's the same thing um, so I think it's very important to, um, to look at what mainstream is doing. Now, I find that green marketers or not-for-profit marketers are just behind the game. And there's also not many of them. So um, if you're going to spend your time researching um, not-for-profit marketing, you'll, you'll be getting secondhand, secondhand information. Now, in saying that, there are some good strategists and good marketers out there. So um, there's just not a lot of them. So in that context, I always, a lot of time I'll do my research within the mainstream uh, marketers. Um, it's also interesting um, in this space because a lot of marketers just simply don't have any ethics. So it's also interesting and they've got high budgets. So it's interesting to see what can be achieved if you've got low ethics, high budget, and to see some of the techniques and some of the results that they're getting. Then when we um, then apply that to activism, we can then apply our level of ethics over it. Um, obviously our budgets are different, um, but we can still get the key learnings about what's happening in the mainstream. Um, the other thing I really recommend is you get an alternative email. I've got an email which is just for email newsletters um, because I think a lot of the learning in uh, digital marketing is actually being marketed too. 
Now, it's really important to then separate you being marketed to to your normal email because if you have, um, you know, your email being marketed to, you, it will just become overwhelm, overwhelming. So in that context, um, when I'm doing um, digital intensive research, I will click on all the marketing ads on Facebook and I will sign up to them and um, I'll see what processes, I'll deconstruct what they're doing, um, how they're communicating with me. I mean, that is the learning process is actually being on that. But the important thing is I don't want my main emails just full of all this crap. So set up a new email. Um, so I'm just gonna jump to, I'll share my screen. Now, NetChange um, is a, a not-for-profit focused um, think tank um, strategists. Um, they are more in um, organizing, not just digital, um, but I'm looking at them as being one of the, the um, leading in this. They, are, they do do digital stuff. As you can see, there's one here, digital um, engagement. Um, network change, etc. So these, uh, this organisation is really um, sophisticated, um, and this is different to mainstream marketing. This is very focused on a not-for-profit context, um, and they've got a lot of research driving why they're saying certain things. So I recommend um, sign up to them, start looking at their stuff. Um, the next um, one I look at is the Common Social Media Library. Um, I built the, this website. Um, there was a, another person that did the graphic design. Then they hired a, well, the organization are some very li library nerds and they love research. So this is this website I'm recommending um, because they do, um, it's really well researched and well filtered. The big issue with um, researching on the internet, as you may know, is there's a little bit of good stuff here and then there's a lot of crap and then there's another little bit of good stuff and there's a lot of crap and you actually start to blur and you don't know what's good and what's crap. So it's really good to actually have somebody that's, that knows a bit about what they're talking about that does that work for you. Um, and Angie was the graphic designer of this website. I'm also a researcher. Um, so th this site has heaps of stuff, but here's their digital campaigning um, stuff to start with. Um, there's a few guides, emails, um, et cetera, et cetera. So there's a really, really good, and this is focused again on not-for-profit organizing. Um, and a lot of this stuff is, is talking specifically. Um, so for example, when you're asking for a donation, it is slightly different than when you're trying to sell a product, even though the core concepts are the same. Um, so there's a lot of beautiful resources there. I recommend you get into it. Um, okay, so the FWD conference um, uh, and organize. So um, organize, they, they sometimes run them as one conference, sometimes they run them as separate. So organize is more about the theory and strategy of community organizing, organizing people. And FWD is the digital component of that. So in my webinar, when I talked about digital strategy, I introduced the fact that digital um, strategy is always a subset of your organizational um, strategy. So they, they sort of divide that there. Um, I think the, there's one, these dates are wrong. I think there's one coming up soon um, and that'll be on online, I assume. But anyway, we can follow that up. So they, they basically have workshops um, and they have um, lots of really good people come together. So I really do recommend the FWD and Organize Conference um, for Pacific not-for-profit um, organizing. And I also give them heads up as well because in earlier conferences, um, uh, so Sally's saying progress is online and cheap to book in right now. Um, the thing I love about FWD and Organize is in the early days, they got a lot of um, criticism from people of color, from people of diversity, and their response is generally to give them the microphone and to change the way they run things and to actually bring those people up. So um, I've got a lot of respect for the way they respond to their criticism in a not-for-profit construct. Um, the other big conference is the Connecting Up conference um, and again they're running theirs online um, it's coming up soon um, so this is really um, this is a this uh, organization focuses a bit more on service providers not-for-profits so by that I mean um, like if you're doing um, a medical supplies or like maybe elderly support or um, social services um, homelessness that sort of like actually providing services 
Uh, obviously, they overlap, and um, so this is more um, sort of service provider type vibe, whereas FWD and organizer more um, campaigner vibe. Um, now, connecting up is also interesting while we're here because they're running their, they also run a full webinar program. Um, if you're into webinars like this one, then they, they also run um, webinars free and paid. Um, and Connecting up is really important for um, Australian not-for-profits because they, they are the Australian representative for TechSoup. Now, to speak English, TechSoup um, is an American organization. So when um, software companies want to give not-for-profit licenses, so for example, Google gives away $10,000 worth of free advertising, uh, AdWords per month for a not-for-profit, they outsource all the management of all their licenses to TechSoup. Um, so for you to get, um, so Adobe, um, there's a whole Microsoft, Apple, there's like all the tech companies, they go through TechSoup um, so that you can get substantial discounts um, and connecting up to the Australian version. So I recommend checking them out. There's heaps of discounts. They also sell hardware, um, computers, that sort of stuff. Um, and you'll save yourself a lot of dollars if you're a registered not-for-profit. Okay, so that's sort of the overview a bit of the um, not-for-profit space for you to go and explore and do more homework. Um, so now I'm going to jump a little bit more to the mainstream. Um, this is Tim Martin. He does um, social media, um, marketing, Google um, workshops. Now I've worked with him on a few things and I know that he's really keen to support not-for-profits. He just doesn't understand how to do that he's he's more focused on a corporate space so um i recommend if you've got some ideas on on collaboration then he'll be all ears um for example he's got a canvas here on how to um work out your social media um in a more of a simplistic way um this social media planning and marketing can get very complex but i urge you just to simplify it to get going start seeing your results and then as you start to grow you can you can get complexity then, but yeah, make things simple in the short term. Um, okay, so Google. Now, Google did a lot of things. One of the things that Google does is they run an academy, and some of them are free and some of them are paid. So this is a course on the fundamentals of digital marketing. Now, this also includes Google certification. So if you, if you wanted this to be your job, um, you want it to be a digital marketer. So if you went to um, your favorite offer profit and go, look, I'm actually certified by Google. I've done the course. You know, that's going to look a lot better on your resume. So there's 26 modules. There's 40 hours here. So I've got my digital marketing down to three sessions of an hour and a half. Like this is 40 hours. So um, quite intense, but it's for free and it's aimed at a beginner. So if you're really um, inspired to become a digital marketer, then this may be a good place to start for you. Um, okay, so the Noob Guide to Online Marketing. Now, this is an old guide. This is 2011, um, but I think it's very relevant and there's still a lot of lessons to be learned from this. Um, they, um, now, Noob, um, for people who don't know what a Noob is, a Noob is a gamer term for people who play video games for like an amateur. It's a similar term to in the surfing culture is calling someone a grommet. So basically it's a beginner's naive person's guide to online marketing. Um, okay, so, and then they've sold it, I think to, to Moz here. Um, but anyway, here's the link to it. And then if we jump down, they've got this infographic and the way it works is it's divided it up all the different things. Now they call their landing pages the glue and you'll see that my, um, pathways um, diagram also circular and it has the website in the middle so this is um, I think um, the key strategy to do that uh, but they go in a lot more detail da, da, da. now you can also download the PDF and um, I recommend you do so the idea is that it's, you start it's a six month setup so they go on on the first day do this and the first week get these things because these are more important then the second week do this da, 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 and for six months so the idea is to build a digital marketing engine for your um, commercial but obviously it can work for not-for-profit um, now to get it you have to tweet them um, this is marketing so with any of these the one now we're moving to the commercial side they're going to get your email and sign up to to get to get the product um, 
that's digital marketing. As I, as I introduce this section though, I do uh, recommend that you actually do go for the ride and actually see what will happen when you download it. Um, what will happen, do they follow you up? What, sort, what is the emails? What sort of language they're using? That sort of stuff. Okay, James Tuckerman, he's a Melbourne based um, consultant. He um, ran, he started up Antil magazine. So he's got a lot of um, background in small business um, and building and marketing for small business. He was one of the early um, adapters from taking his magazine from print to online. So he has a lot, a wealth of knowledge um, in the mainstream small business environment. The thing I'm recommending James for is that he has a lot of free webinars that are quite quality. Um, for example, I did his Facebook um, um, pipeline webinar um, and his model is he gives a lot of free content up front and then shows you how hard it is and then basically then wants to sign you up to a course where he mentors and helps you to do the hard stuff. Um, but that's really great because he's providing good free content. Um, now this one I just, um, I found searching when I was updating my links for this webinar. Um, so I just thought that this was quite a nice uh, guide. Um, when I was researching, a lot of the guides are just over the top for, for this audience or yeah. Um, yeah. So I did a bit just looking at um, what would work for, for this audience that I'm working with. Uh, yeah, I've just got, um, Glenn, maybe when your market is more corporate, consider LinkedIn as a marketing avenue. Yes, I, I do agree. Um, there's a lot of, um, scope for LinkedIn at the moment. Um, Facebook and Instagram are very saturated. So that means it's hard to get traction. Um, LinkedIn is, is sort of growing as a medium. So therefore your content is more likely to go out there. So I've been, um, focusing on LinkedIn um, to promote my, my content for these webinars. Um, and my next phase of marketing will be focusing a lot on LinkedIn because we're, because um, I'll be selling consultancy services um, and digital services to um, people that are usually um, at a professional level, even though they may be in a small grassroots groups on the ground. So they're likely to have a LinkedIn profile and be looking at my profile and those sort of things. So um, yeah, the, and again, the that comes back to the point of looking at what your audience, where your audience is, what platforms they're using so that you can um, target those in that way. Okay. Um, benefits, not features. Now I've put and in there, so I will promote to say, you want to sell the benefits and features. So I just want to go, go through what this statement means because it's very important for um, our digital marketing um, to be communicating the benefits. Um, so this is once you're, you're touching with people, what are you communicating? So this is a bit of a frame um, to use. So in this context, we're looking at what can this do or what can we do or why is that campaign? What can we do for the person? Now, a lot of people want to say, well, what can a person do for us? But we want to be looking at what can we do for them? And by person, I'm using the word, you know, user, customer, activist, et cetera, et cetera. So in that context, like what we can do for them, well, maybe we can just make them feel better. Um, by donating or getting involved in your campaign can actually just maybe um, that can empower them, um, those sort of things. So we're looking at um, rather than going, you know, you can do this to, to save the forest. It's like you can, um, saving the forest, doing this can make you feel like this or you can be empowered to help save the forest. So it's just a really different way of framing it, but it's really important. And I find that some of the, um, we talked in earlier webinars about humanizing data. And I think that a lot of marketers, they just look at people's stats and data. Uh, it's really important to look at them as um, people and how they're gonna feel and think about the communication. Here's an example I just got off the internet. So supplements um, or vitamins, the features could be that, you know, they boost your bones or they um, help your immune system, this or that. 
but the actual benefits to the person is they want to get stronger or they want to win Miss Universe in this example or sleep better. Um, so in that context, if you're marketing these supplements, you'll be saying these will make you sleep better, not so much the, the technical um, features of, of this. Um, this will increase the chemicals which help, which help promote sleep. That's why also I've got and, not or. So a lot of marketers going, you, you should just sell the benefits, not the um, features. Whereas I'm saying, well, smart people will um, respond very well to the benefits, but then they also look at the features. Like, why would this supplement help me sleep better? And then you can start looking at the features as well. And I also think it's important um, to not treat people as they're stupid. Whereas a lot of marketers just see people as just malleable. Um, so here's another example. Um, the features here is that it's wood, it's unbreakable, it's cloth. However, the benefits of the umbrella is it's sunny, it, it helps keep the sun off and helps keep you dry. So in this context, um, if we're marketing the umbrellas, we'll be more looking at like, this great umbrella is really convenient, it helps you keep you dry, um, it fits in your purse, it's really easy, it fits your lifestyle. Right, um, and then um, rather than talking about more of the specifics of how the actual arms open up. And a, and a key example of this is also car ads, especially luxury car ads. Um, so cars will uh, have a lot of complexity. They've got really advanced engineering, they've got advanced efficiencies and all this stuff that we can talk about, about why this motor is better than that motor. But if you look at say Mercedes or a um, BMW ad, you'll see that there's the driving a car out in the out, out, outside on a, beautiful big road they're talking about freedom and lifestyle they'll probably put in attractive person turning their head looking at them so in that context luxury cars are no longer selling the fact that they're a superior technology they are, are selling that it's a lifestyle or how you're going to feel when you're driving this car you're going to feel freedom you're going to feel the attention you're going to feel like you're you're someone important so it's the feeling um, and then additionally, they have another type of marketing, whereas they'll send all the stats and that to the actual car, car magazines and the car websites that are interested only in the facts and figures and the stats. So those audi that audience will jump to there and will reinforce both audiences. So in that context, a lot of people with luxury car, they'll say, well, the nerd car nerds over there are saying that this is an awesome car. Um, so therefore, when I'm telling other people why I'm buying it, it's because it's an awesome car, but really what they're buying is the actual, um, how they're feeling and that they look really cool in the car. Um, pretty much you look at nearly every car coming out of the market is just way over spec for any 110 Ks on a road, uh, city and driving, um, all those sort of things. Um, and the, another really interesting example is Apple versus, um, Microsoft, um, I couldn't find any examples when I did the research, but there's a period a couple of years ago when Microsoft jumped into the market of the portable um, music player. This was when iPods were really early. So the um, features are one gigabytes of MP3s. So that, that, that's technically what it does. But what the actual um, benefits to users is a thousand songs in your pocket. Um, really key difference it's actually the same thing technically but the way you're framing it a thousand songs in my pocket is a different cell to actually storage uh the other um it, it's also interesting to look at apple um marketing way from the start because they're always minimalist they will sell an idea before they sell the the tech so they, they do have very good technical specifications and um, in later years they're becoming less competitive on those but however, they still will sell the idea that Mac is minimal. Mac. So if you have a look at the packaging that Apple's come in, um, it's always um, very simple pictures, very simple um, slogans. Um, you go to the Apple website and the first page will be like what you can do with it. Um, and then you'll click a tab that's got the specifications. So it's just really a different way of framing it. So in a um, not-for-profit context, um, there's a lot of learnings there. So in that context, it's also um, looking at framing that with, for not-for-profit and, and an example is instead of um, saving, saving the forest for the orangutans, it's about um, 
how how you can then sell the benefits for that person to save their orangutan. They can feel better about it. They can offset some of their guilt of um, some of their behaviour, or they may be um, you know be able to um, with some merchandise show to their friends that they help save that. Um, so what's more interesting, which is motivating that person to actually to save the orangutan. Now, of course, we are focusing at people that care, um, but we also do want to take them to the next level, or we also want to get people that don't care to actually care about the orangutans, right? That's, that'd be uh, an ideal situation as a not-for-profit profit marketer to actually get someone to care about something that they otherwise wouldn't have. Um, so in that context, we... Um, the, the reason we're doing this is we increase our, um, our results. Um, and in that context, lead to, to more donations, et cetera. Um, so we really want to then look at um, the individual, how they feel about um, our marketing. And we did an exercise on Friday using T-shirts, um, looking at people's social status. So we basically grabbed four T-shirts, um, which were all, all Save the Planet theme. And then we got people to choose which one that they would wear. And then we were able to deconstruct like why they would wear that t-shirt. And we could look at social status and those sort of things. So you, you can check that one out. It's up on YouTube. Uh, and we're really looking at people's personal identity, like why they would want to associate themselves with your campaign or with getting involved with your actions. We also want to explore their fears and dreams um, so that we can then talk to them a little bit more about that. Um, and also on Friday's webinar, I gave an example of a gym, um, which was basically a psychological cell. So I'll just explain a little bit about that because a key part of the, um, the gym membership sales was benefits, not features. So we'd give them an interview at the, at the start of the tour of the gym and would work out what that they wanted to get from the gym. Some people wanted to um, lose weight. So you'd look at that a bit more. You'd ask them in more detail. Why would they want to lose weight? Well, maybe because they're feeling depressed or maybe because their, their partner's not um, giving them attention anymore. Maybe they're getting married. Um, they would, maybe they want to gain weight. Maybe they're feeling like um, less, less um, amongst their peers. So in that context, you're looking at what is motivating them to join the gym. Then um, when you're showing them the gym, you're not talking about, well, here's the, here's the exercise machine where you can just run until you're in a sweat every day for 30 minutes and it lets you go for 30 minutes, 50 minutes, and you can adjust it. That, that's not really exciting, the features. Um, but what is more um, exciting to that user, to that person, is that um, you can cycle for 40 minutes and then that will um, cut, start cutting your fat and then if you start doing that like a couple of days a week, then we'll get you in shape in no time and then you'll look hot for your partner. So you're not selling them the actual the bike, it's what the bike can do for them. Um, instead of showing them the heavy weights, so you can lift as many weights as you want and you can lift them heavier and heavier. Now that sounds a bit painful, um, rather than if you um, use these the weights every day for a couple of days, then, then you'll actually start getting the results, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so it's yeah, really important to frame it from um, a really horrible gym piece of gym equipment that's boring and painful to the actual effects that you get from the gym equipment, which is um, uh, how you feel, um, how you look, how people perceive you, back to social status, all those sort of things. Um, and another example for um, not-for-profits is um, what we affectionately call the FESA, um, community versus a mainstream not-for-profit community. So FESAS, for those that don't know, um, uh, is an appropriation of the term feral, which used to be a derogatory term. Um, so now it's a term used with pride. So more of your radical activists, maybe. Um, so in, in that context, they will um, be more, you know, do-it-yourself clothes. They'll have more of a punk aesthetic. Um, they'll be more like, screw you. First to say maybe more of a mainstream not-for-profit that's aiming at, um, you know, more mainstream people. They may wear suits to uh, events or they'll at least wear smart casual business attire if they're speaking in public. So in that context, if your campaign um, is, is um, 
targeting more of a FESA crew or for more mainstream crew, then you can then frame the campaign, the benefits um, more to what they'll resonate with, what's in it for them. Okay, any questions with that? Okay, cool. Now I'm gonna talk about a sales funnel. And um, a lot of people, when we start talking about sales funnels, um, just think corporate business. Um, and I was in a core, a strategic call with a not-for-profit um, the other week, and I then explained um, a sales funnel in their context and it made a bit more sense. I'm also going to then also jump back to the pathways document that I've, I've pretty much run in every one of these webinars, um, the pathways. So sales funnel is just another way of also looking at the same pathways. Um, and then in that context, we also, we're looking at a specific example. So the one I've got on the run sheet, uh, I'll show you the run sheet. You can see my sales funnel there that I did with um, just here. So uh, this is a funnel that's specifically talking about an event. So we want a person to come to our event. So in that context, um, the first stage of digital marketing is always um, the initial reach. Um, how do you initially get to them? So in this context, and I've just made up these numbers, but we are actually then going to use these numbers to, we're gonna look at stats and we're gonna actually, you can actually document this. If you, your social media and your um, Google Analytics are saying you've reached a thousand people, and then you can also look at your stats, say that you actually had 200 people visit your site. You, you've got your um, analytics in your newsletter, which is saying that you've got 50 people sign up to the newsletter. And then from there, you've got 20 people that actually read your newsletter. You sent out the 50, only 20 read it. Um, and then from there, four of them um, registered and then one came to an event. So this is a pretty standard model though. You always get drop off um, through each stage. Um, so in this context, it's um, important to, to define these funnels for the different uh, things that you're doing or different approaches. So if you're trying to get donations, then you could go, okay, well, what is the actual full process of getting a donation? Um, what are the different steps that people are going through? Um, and this is related, if not the same thing as our journey, um, user journeys that we did in the first session, um, pathways, that sort of stuff. Um, the another term is ladders so in this context we we really it's important to look at this because then we can look at um volume plus conversion and these are two key concepts to look at with um sales funnels and why it's good to visualize a sales funnel in this way the first way of looking at it is if i want two people to come to the event then i need to get a thousand people to see it because the mass is a thousand two hundred fifty forty four to one so in that case, I would then go, right, well, if it's going to cost me, um, you know, $100 or $500 to reach 500,000 people, then that means that I'll get 500 people to my event. So, so for $500, I'm just talking a hypothetical medium here, $500, I can then get 500 people to my event. Great. So that's one way of approaching it, just like increase the volume at the top of the funnel and you increase the the volume at the bottom of the funnel. The other more interesting um, approach, and that both you should be doing both of these, is conversion. So this is how effective you are. So if we go to a hundred, a thousand people um, on our social, and only two hundred go to our site. Now, if we could optimize our social media content so that more people go back to our website. Um, so you've got a better call to action, mate. You've got better content. You've got more emotional um, writing. You're really looking at their benefits of why I should visit the website, not just because you want me to go to the website. So, so then if we can get 400 people to um, click from 1,000 people on the social, that means we've then doubled our um, people come to the event. And then the same way, um, if we can get twice as many people to sign up to our newsletter. So then we really got to refine our ask. Do we have those pop-ups of newsletter pop-ups? Like what is going to convince somebody to sign up to the newsletter? What is the copy there? That sort of thing. Um, okay. So then um, your newsletters, like if you're sending out boring newsletters all the time, people aren't going to read them. So again, to increase your um, conversion, you then look at, well, what is our role of email and how are we using it? And then, um, 
the copy in your email to get more people to register for an event. Um, so say we've got four people registering for an event, but only one comes per four people. Why is that? Um, so to increase conversion, we could say, well, maybe we need to follow them up, um, send them some reminders, or maybe we can send them um, some exciting things that are going to happen at the event um, as we've trickled the event. Or maybe we can also then run, um, continue our social media because back to the concept of we need to hear them eight touch points, even though they've signed up, we, if we hit them with some more touch points, it may reinforce it. So then we can maybe get for every four people that register, we may get two people. So if we refine that conversion down all the steps of the funnel, we may be able to turn that thousand to five. And then, then we can say, so if we want 500, then we need to get da da da. So that, that's a really interesting way of looking at it. Um, because I find that a lot of people with doing digital marketing, they just will have one of those bits of the funnel where they're just not interested in or they're just not um, paying attention to. And then they're just losing that conversion. Um, so it's the whole process that's really important. And you'll see that as a theme um, through all my webinars is that define the process, then optimize it, optimize it, test it, um, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so a key part of this um, funnel is a CRM, a Client Relationship Manager. So this is a, basically a database um, and in this example, it's the database where people sign up to your newsletter. Um, now we're doing a whole webinar on organising people with databases um, and we're pretty much going to run that as um, getting some experts on the the, the most recommended platforms and talking about the pros and cons and that sort of stuff. Um, so we'll be doing two sessions on um, CRMs uh, as part of that. Okay, so now I'm gonna talk about some other cheesy marketing, which is an opt-in gift or lead magnet, which is part of the um, marketing. So this is usually used at the first phase where we're, um, actually I'll just go stop share where we're um, first reaching people. So to increase the conversion of people um, that you reach through your marketing to people who come to your site and sign up, uh, there's a concept called um, opt-in gift. So for example, if we jump back to the um, market, the noobs for mar marketing for noobs guide, then um, that is the opt-in gift. Like that is the lead magnet. So um, you're going to the website, you're signing up for the thing, downloading it um, and you'll find that when you go through um, all of those um, marketing um, processes somewhere there they'll have something free that then you can download so I'm going to uh, just share screen and just show you some cheesy examples of this concept and this is from a company called King Kong and they're like one of these hyper cheesy uh, mainstream uh, marketing companies. So they've got a, this is a PDF, five things to super successful to do online. And then they've got you know, a few pages of written content, et cetera, et cetera. Um, another one here is steps to creating killer content strategy. they are eight times your leads. So in this case, they're saying um, we will increase your conversion by eight times using these steps. And so it's sort of these little um, bite-sized bits of bait and I'm um, like, yeah, I want that. So then you'll sign up and then they'll keep sending you quality content until you're resonating with their brand and then they can go for the sale. Another example is uh, six hacks to crush it with Instagram ads. Um, they use really over the top language, 300% um, results, that sort of stuff. But you'll get the idea there. So in a not-for-profit context, um, so in my context, um, what one of the next phases after I've done the webinars is I'll be converting a lot of these key concepts into um, eBooks, PDF, um, so that then I can also send them out in, this, in the same context. Um, so I just wanted to talk a little bit now about not-for-profit adaption of this concept because obviously you're not going to have a, um, a cheesy opt-in gift on your website to sell leads. Okay, so um, so one of the um, current ones is to appeal to people's emotions. So instead of getting a PDF, you get an emotional um, feel-good about something or you get an empowerment. Um, which is the traditional way is a petition or an email action. So I'll be like, you know, save the orangutans, sign this petition. 
And so when someone's signing it, they feel like they've done something. It, it, it's that feeling. So that's that's the opt-in gift there, even though we don't see it. It is that emotional um, um, empowerment or the feeling I've done something. Um, so the thing is, most petitions um, are irrelevant as a, a petition. Um, a digital petition pretty much, um, in some cases they work, but pretty much they're, they're completely ineffective. What you run um, petitions for is that it's to get people's email so then you can continue along the uh, process so that you can actually um, build a relationship so then you can actually get them to do something actually effective. And um, sometimes it's really hard to get someone to do something effective first relationship. So you might get them to do something that they think sort of might work, even though it doesn't, but at least you can start that process. Um, you know, email actions, which is, um, you know, click here and we'll send an email to a politician to say that we're gonna stop logging. Um, again, politicians pretty much gonna ignore those, but what it will allow you to, what allow you to start that process. Um, so this is, Stand away, not for profits are doing that at the moment. And it is the same thing. It is an opt-in gift. It's a lead magnet. It's just a different way of thinking about it. Um, so I've also got on my list here, adaption two. So this is um, maybe a, applying that mainstream way of thinking um, to a not for profit context. So for example, how to guides. So you may, if you're say saving the forest, you may have a guide on how to run a forest blockade or how to run a forest campaign, or how to run a um, fundraising night for the forests, or something like that. Just so that people that um, want to be empowered and want to get involved, um, but are a bit skeptical, don't really want to um, get involved with your org, then they can download these guides and um, actually start doing the things. Merchandise is another um, really good um, approach. Um, Again, it's not a free gift, but um, maybe you could work out some way that there is a free gift. Maybe you'll um, post them a poster. So we did a series of um, anti-nuclear maps. So we basically um, mapped out all the nuclear sites in Australia and we got sponsorship to print them. So we'll post them. Um, so if you go to um, Friends of the Earth um, Anti-Nuclear Collective, they'll post those posters to anybody. So we could um, reframe that to like, if you sign up, we'll, we'll send you a free poster or, or whatever. And the other interesting thing is quality educational resources. So someone may be really interested in the forest. So it could be, you know, the birds of the forest and you could produce some, a really good ebook on, on the birds of the forest um, or other, you know, really beautiful things about the forest that people go, this is great. I want to learn more about the forest. Um, and in which case that's really good because then you, obviously get their contacts so you can then start talking to them about saving the forest but then it's also emotionally connecting them to the forest a bit more so you know if you sit down with your people and sort of did a brainstorm of like what would work as an opt-in gift or lead magnet um and you know you can have that with or without the cheese um but the the, the concept just um to repeat that is that in the sales funnel the thousand people reached in social media, if you reach people, say, paid advertising, really, really weak lead. And it's uh, unlikely that they're going to then action or click onto your website. Um, especially if you're looking at it like save save the forest, they'll be like, whatever, keep scrolling. Whereas if you've got, um, so the idea of an opt-in is to actually get them to then um, go, oh, this is something for me. And then they'll click through to the website. So if you're saying, instead of saying, um, you know, click here to save the forest, it might go, uh, click here to get a free um, PDF download of all the um, of the the birds in the forest, or um, you know, a um, birds in the forest educational guide for kids, or something like that. Then people go, yeah, that's cool. I'd like that free resource. They can click through. Now, I'm not saying this should replace your normal marketing about save the forest. However, it could be an additional and things that you can experiment with. Because um, the idea of you really need to experiment to get from 1,000, um, that number from 1,000 to 2,000. Uh, sorry, from 1,000 um, people to your social to 200 to visit your site. So these are sort of ideas where you can incre increase that, increase that conversion. Another really important um, part of sales funnels and um, pathways conversions is automation. So for example, if you sign up on my commercial website, um, just on the contact form, 
basically I'll email automatically send you an email and it will say um, so most people when they're wanting to build a website they'll be um, how much does it cost so the main question so I send back an email and this is important because if I'm too expensive for somebody then they'd be good to talk about that up front um, or if I'm too cheap or not right for them so I basically send an email saying here's my rates that doesn't really mean much because um, we quote custom, but here's some examples of um, some quotes um, and here's how we work. So I'll also show how we work because we work a little bit different to a normal agency. So if people go, mm, yeah, nah, then that allows them to like shoot an email back going, yeah, sorry, this ain't gonna work. Now for the few people that that resonates with, then that means that then when we call them and speak to them the next time, then we've already had that conversation. That's really interesting because a lot of people, even though it's a robot that sends it and it's signed by my name, they actually think I sent it. And I've got emails going back, oh, thanks for the fast reply, that's really great. And so that psychological um, start of that, of that relationship is that they contacted me and then straight away they got a response with all the information they need. Um, so that was just an automated email. You can just set that up. So any sign up form that you've got, what you should be sending an email, say thank you or um, something like that. Um, now, depending on what you're doing, you can also set it up. Um, so for example, they've signed up for a week, then maybe in two weeks, you might send them an, another email saying, hey, it's been two weeks and um, we've been doing these things. Do you wanna get involved or, or whatever your pathway is? So once you've worked out your pathway, you're looking at how can we automate this as much as possible um, to save time and resources, but also to be more efficient. And then you can also test, see how that works. Um, so a lot of your CRMs, um, especially these days, do automation. Um, there's also um, tools like Zapier, which um, allows you to, order, to connect different types of software. So you might be using different types of software you're placing together and you want to have a situation where person does this, it goes to that, da, da, da. I mean, they're getting a little bit more complex, but the concept's pretty basic. Like how can we automate this? And um, it will save you a heap of time in the future, but it also makes you more effective and it makes your um, experience for your user so much richer, um, quite important. Another concept um, in digital marketing is called remarketing. Now the idea of that is that you market to people who have already um, interacted with you. So there's sort of different levels. So for example, if someone's donated to you, then you would then market just to that list. So that's, that's quite common in not-for-profits at the moment. So if someone donates to you through your CRM, then you have them tagged and then you would um, contact them um, with special asks. Um, or if they're really big donors, you'd actually have people whose job it is just to, um, to look, at, look at that side of things. Um, but remarketing is also much finer than that. So with some, some of the CRMs, you can actually track um, if they saw you on social media and clicked on a link or liked a link. So that might be a very small um, response. However, if you're then paying for a Facebook ad, you might say, right, well, we're going to send the Facebook ad. Own. We've had 3,000 people that have liked something. We're just going to send it to them because they're more likely to interact with that content because they've already liked something of ours um, than, than just a stranger, not a stranger, someone who's never interacted with us before. So remarketing can be very quite thin all the way down to like a full donor. Um, but it's important to, to think about remarketing. Um, in that context though, then you, you need to set up data and um, management. But this is one of the reasons why you'd set up data and data systems and CRMs in the first place so that then you can um, remarket to them. And I, I would also just add another um, ethics, um, inverted commas. Um, the marketing industry basically has no ethics as far as tracking and um, marketing, like tracking people, building big databases. Um, the Cambridge Analytical scandal is a good example of that. So I think it's also really important for our, um, us not-for-profit people just to also think about um, the ethical layer. So if um, someone's clicked on uh, something that we've liked before and um, they're already in a, a medium like Facebook that's tracking them, uh, it's actually, I don't see that any negative ethics to then send them something that may be interesting. But if they're then going to the point of um, installing Facebook 
track pixels and you're um, starting to like track them outside of their understanding, then it does get to quite a gray area. Um, and I think the ethics of this sort of uh, marketing needs to be um, discussed in a lot more detail, mainstream and also not for profit. Um, and then um, here's another quite cheesy um, marketing concept, but it's really important, cost per acquisition. So cost per acquisition. So this is the cost it takes to get, get someone to do the thing. So in our sales funnel context we've got here, it's what is the cost to get one person to the event? So back to the sales funnel, we spent, um, you know, $500 doing content, producing content so that we could push it out to our social media. And we spent another $500 on advertising um, to push it out. And then we got 20 people to come to the event. So then that works out, whatever the maths is. Um, per person, it cost us $6 to get to the event. That is a really key um, term so in a commercial context if your profit of that event is five dollars and it costs you six dollars to get them there you're not going to be in business for very long um so the idea is is with the sales funnel um we've talked about volume and conversion but it's also to reduce the cost per acquisition now in a not-for-profit context it's um how, how much does it cost to pay for a full-time campaigner that runs the campaign like what does it cost per um you, know, you can work it out in the same way because what you're looking at is the efficiencies there and try to increase your effectiveness. And so it is important to put a capitalist frame over this because it allows you to just be more efficient, more efficient, more efficient, which is far better because when you're asking people for money, you can look them in the eye and say, look, we, we run as efficiently as possible. We're going to spend your money the best way possible. Um, and um, our marketing is da -da -da. Um, but it's a really, key um, factor to be looking at what is this costing you and again um, a lot of this is data driven and I get that you know a small team can't have all this complex data so even if you're just guessing like even if you have no time for this at least go I reckon it's costing us about five dollars this so then um, if you're just guessing at that point it might be a quick meeting with your team and go what do you guess is costing what do you guess is costing um, and then you can at least have an idea of what you're doing. Um, if you're just blindly running a, a marketing campaign and social media and this, and you have no idea what it's costing you, then you're probably not going to be effective or efficient with anything you're doing. And then this segues us to data and improvement planning. Okay, so there's a real um, difference in online marketing to offline marketing. And that is everything's measurable. Everything's measurable. So it's really important to measure everything. Now you measure everything, well you don't measure everything, it's um, in, in context to what we're doing. Then you actually use that, that data. So in that context, I really recommend that you get, um, whether you're doing that monthly or a few monthly, is you're actually getting a summary of all these different data and then you translate that to human terms and then you can present that to the team. It goes back to cost, cost per acquisition. So you might go, look, we've spent you know 50 hours doing this and we've got this many likes, we've got this many um, people sign up, we've got this many people take action. This is really key because you might um, say, well, look, I've been really good digital marketer in our not-for-profit and we've got all these results. Now, if I could pay for a part-time person to help me, we can like exponentially, we can go exponential and we can really win this campaign. Now, how would you then convince somebody who doesn't understand digital of that argument? They're like, what do you mean? It's just Facebook. Why would you want to pay for another like person to when we could be... So in that context, if you've actually got the statistics and you can show this is what I've done with this many hours, but the framework's in place, now all I need to do is plumb content through it. So if you can give me the, like, so it's really important to be able to frame what you're doing. Um, so you want to track what you're doing, then you want to test what you're doing and then refine it. So um, jumping back to that sales funnel is that you want to track how people are going through the funnel and then you want to, um, do experiments on how to improve those sort of things and then you want to um, then you want to just always refining refining so part of a digital marketer's job is constant refining of their pathways 
brand personalities, um, personas, how people are interacting, all that sort of stuff. Um, and then if you get really good with your specific community, um, then you'll get, get the results. And Sally's just posted to the chat, the Australian um, Progress event, um, which we talked about earlier. She just sent a link to that. So I do recommend. Um, and also um, Greg has sent um, options for bulk printing. Um, there's also the sustainable paper guide if you're doing home printing. Although I also would recommend um, a, a paperless office and only be printing when you really, really need to. Okay. Now with all these stats and figures and data, blah, 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 the most important thing to remember is what is your, your ultimate metric is your goal. So I started this whole webinar series with goals. So if your goal is to get a donation, then that's your ultimate metric. Really your conversions and your, your Facebook and this and that doesn't mean much in context to, if you're, if, to the stats on your goal. Now, if you're not for profit, donations also isn't that great a goal. Generally the big, big, big orgs are more into that side of things. But it might be like how many people you got to come to the protest in the forest. So if your aim is to get people into the forest, then that is your ultimate metric. And then the, all the other metrics and all the other data is just supportive of that. So if someone's arguing, well, we've got heaps more Facebook likes and you're like, well, we've got more people in the forest. I think the strategy, the latter strategy is far more effective than who cares how many Facebook likes you've got. So always put your ultimate metric in context to all this other stuff that I'm, I'm saying here. Um, so it's really important to refine your personas and improve your service design. So I did a webinar previously talking in detail about what user personas are and the service design. So you can check that out. Um, but the basic idea is you're um, setting up a system where you, when you first see them, so when they go through the processes to the end result where they've come to the forest or they've donated or done something like that. So you're trying to refine that along the way. Um, okay, so you can also get some basic data coming out of Facebook and Google Analytics. So I'm just going to share screen and just have a look at that quickly. Okay, it's always risky jumping into Facebook in a live context, but here we go. This is my page. And so if you click home and you're actually, and it's your page, you'll have this thing called insights. And they're sort of doing that in the short term. So um, people reached, post engagements, people likes. Now you'll see huge increases. That's mainly because I don't post much. And now that I'm running the webinar thing, then I'm posting every time I publish on the YouTube, I'm posting, et cetera, et cetera. So I'm getting obviously a lot more engagements and things like that. But um, this is really interesting stats as far as your pipelines. Um, so if I go click see all, let me get some more data come in. And I'm just gonna jump down to people. Because remember where we talked earlier about uh, character personas and who's coming. So we can actually see what's happening. So most of the people here are coming from Australia. And um, within Australia, they're coming from Melbourne. Now that makes sense because that's my personal networks and I'm using my social media quite a lot to promote these. Um, and I'm still implementing my um, search marketing. So I'm actually doing it um, opposite to what I'm recommending in this webinar where I'm starting with social, I'm gonna follow up with my SEO. Um, so that makes sense. Now we look at here, 57% um, I'm, I'm engaging with more with women than men. Now this makes sense as reinforcing my experience with my offline training. And I tend to find, and this is um, an assumption, that women are more like, well, men are more likely to say, I know how to do something and just wing it. Whereas women are more likely to go, actually, I want to actually learn how to do this properly. And so I find that I just simply get more women coming to my digital training and they're prepared to actually learn how to do it properly rather than just wing it. Um, so we're looking at demographic 20, 25 to 34. Um, but my big one is 35 to 44. So that, that makes sense. Um, with the feedback. It's usually um, 35 to 44 where people um, 
uh, at that stage with that upskilling, they're trying to build upon their skills, that sort of stuff. Um, and if I jump to, this is action skills. So we're up 1,600%, um, um, so massive stats. Um, but that's mainly because I was dominant, not because I'm a miracle marketer. Um, and then again, if we jump to people, we can start to see see those stats. So this is interesting. We're getting even less less men interested in um, action skills than um, women, for example. Um, we're still getting an overrepresentation of Melbourne. Um, the Cambodia stat is really interesting. Um, so I assume that I've got a um, someone in my networks is promoting into um, Cambodia. I thought that I'd actually get probably a bit more United States. Anyway, so that'll give you a bit of a, a idea of what's happening. So if you you start learning what this means and paying attention. So if you're um, if you're doing various events or maybe you're doing a campaign, you can then look at the traffic, see who it's resonating with. If you're targeting men and you're getting mostly women, then maybe look at your language and your framing, um, that sort of thing. Okay, so let's jump to Google Analytics. So this is um, the actionskills.co um, website. Um, now, Google Analytics is super complex. So I'm going to just give you, again, don't be scared of data. So my, what are my main um, thing to get across is at least look at it and understand a little bit about it, like some of the more important things, um, even if you're not having to learn the whole advanced stuff. Okay, so just looking over here. Um, so this is for the last seven days. I've had um, 23 um, sessions in seven days. So that's really low traffic. But in saying that though, I'm also doing quite low marketing. I'm down 18%. So I did a lot more um, marketing there last week than I did this week. Um, bounce rate. Bounce rate's a really interesting um, stat because what a bounce rate is, it's like someone's come to a page and then they've got, they haven't gone to any other page on the website. So that could be really bad. It could be someone's gone to the website, they've gone, what is this? This isn't for me and they've gone away. Or, they could have gone to the page and gone, this is for me and signed up and then gone. So I can look at this stat is more interesting when I look at what is the bounce rate and the numbers to my signups. So if I'm, if I'm correlating like the conversion of how many people come to my website and sign up, I might say my web page is so great that they've signed up on the first page um, and then bounced. Or it could be a case of like the web, the page is crap and I've just, I've just bounced. So that's a really interesting stat, your bounce rate. Um, generally, if you've got an information-based website or you've got a different type of journey, um, you're trying to lower that bounce rate because you want them to visit a few pages before they bounce off. Now, session duration, two minutes and 55 seconds. That's massive. Um, generally, you're looking at 30 seconds. Um, so I've, I've started embedding my videos so I could look at that a bit more and, and maybe they've just loaded the page and started watching the video, which would then skew my stats quite a lot because then, um, you know, they're on, the, look, on there for an hour watching the video. Or um, it could be this really well-written copy and people are reading it. Now, that latter doesn't make sense because um, I don't have long, any long-form um, content on my website. So... Um, that's an interesting stat that we can look at in a little bit more detail. Okay, so here we're going. Um, this is the, where do we acquire users? Now this is really, really gold for any digital marketer because like where are we getting our traffic from? Um, we want more traffic, so where's it coming from? So referral is, is um, a different date. So we're getting, on these days I'm getting most of my referrals um, organic search, direct, other. So that means even though I'm not optimizing for search, I'm still getting ranked in my search engine. So this is really good news for me. And when I go talk about search engines tomorrow, I'll talk about how to structure your websites for search engines, even though you may not be optimizing. So let's look at this data a little bit more um, in detail. Um, I'm gonna click on the acquisition tab.
Okay, so I can see a little bit more referral. Now, referral means it's a link from another website. Organic search, 26%. So this is exciting to me. I'm really excited because before I've even started my search optimization, I'm already ranking. That's, that's really exciting. Now, direct means someone's typed in the URL. Um, that's really high and that looks odd to me because if I had run a, if I had run a poster campaign, Okay, that makes sense because someone's seen my web address on a poster and they've just typed it in. For So what may be happening is people are seeing it and then typing it in at a later date. Not quite sure. Um, but I want to look at this referral tab. I want to see where they're coming from. Action skills, so ASIN. All right, so this is coming from the ASIN website. Okay, so this is making a bit more sense because Glenn, Glenn Todd and Devise are two of my websites and they're both optimized for Google. So what may be happening is that people are um, searching for something, they're going to my other websites and then I'm promoting my webinar, which is then um, converting. So that's also an interesting, we, in one of the earlier webinars, we were looking at all the different assets that we have. Um, so I'm in this case using my assets to bring traffic to this specific site. Um, And then I can actually see what numbers is coming through. All right, um, if I just go acquisition again, come over it. I wanna see, I wanna see it for a month. I wanna see it's data for a month. Now I haven't been live for a month, so we still got the same data. So this is a, this is a really, um, there's, there's not much data in this actual um, analytics, but at least I can at least give you an introduction and have a look at what's happening. Um, behavior. This is really key because when we're looking at conversions, it's like, where are they going? Let's have a look. Okay, so they're going to forward slash. This forward slash means they're coming to my website. So that's great. They're going to my homepage. So that's interesting because all of my marketing has been to forward slash webinars. And if I look at this, then that just hasn't worked. Um, so that would probably mean that my marketing is not working very well. They're coming to forward slash resources. That's interesting. Um, and forward slash events. This actually, I'm actually on the wrong website. Okay, this makes me a bit more sense. All right, so this is actionskills.org, not.co. So this is explaining, <laughs> this will explain it a bit more. All right, so in context, uh, I'm running two websites. So dot org is, um, the first website's been running for a few years. So I've been promoting my um, free resources. I've been giving out free resources for many years. So this would explain the traffic coming here. Um, I've run events in the past. And then, so this, so we're actually looking to see what webs, what pages they're looking at. Okay, behavior flow. So this is showing when people go from one page to the next page, to the next page. So this is really useful for your pathways to see what's working and what's not. Um, so I think it's really important for you, even if you're not that interested in um, statistics, to start looking at how people are using the website. Because in here, if you've spent all this time and effort on a certain page or campaign or part of your website and people aren't getting to it, then you need to work out how to fix that conversion to get them there. Site content, um, here's the pages that come into a lot more stats, et cetera, et cetera. Um, now conversions, I've used the word conversions a lot. This is more the advanced part of Google. Um, so I'm not gonna go through that here, but the basic gist is that you can actually set your goals, what your pathways are. You can put trackers on your website and you can actually track to see how people are converted. Um, An audience, I'm gonna have a quick look at audience because we're always interested in, in uh, who and what. Um, oh, here we go, user demographics. Here's what I'm looking for. Okay, so here we go, we're looking at the age. 18 to 24, um, 30, 35 to 34, uh, um, more people are coming to my website, actually. Oh, okay, I don't actually have this um, enabled. 
So in that case, I'll, I'll enable that in my own time and that'll give me more details. This used to be enabled, so I'm assuming that Google switched it off due to um, privacy, privacy laws. Um, but as you can see here, there's some really advanced tracking um, and stuff that you can look at. So this is just a quick snapshot of analytics, but it will give you um, a good idea of what pages are working, where people are going to. If you're having a look at also your Facebook data, you can say the same thing. So you're starting to see like where you're putting your efforts and your time, what's working and what's not. Phew, I'm gonna just jump back to the um, track sheet. All right, so yeah, we talked about traffic volume pages. Okay, A-B testing. So A-B testing is an important part of marketing. And I'll make a point that um, modern marketers will now um, say they don't know what, the, what they're doing. So in the old days, they'll go, we're a professional marketer, we know what we're doing, so we're gonna write the best copy and we're gonna make the best ad and it's gonna be awesome. Now what they say is that, I don't know. I, I'm going to create a framework where I test it, I'm gonna, re, I'm gonna test it, get the data back, I'm gonna refine it, and they're gonna produce the best ad possible. So this is a paradigm shift and it's based on data. Um, and so people with the smaller egos are going to be more, more um, effective at this because they're purely looking at data and systems rather than, you know, I'm a great marketer. So, uh, so if you put a Facebook ad or if you put a Google ad, they'll ask you to put three versions of those ads. So in that case, you might go, okay, I'm going to try this picture. I'm going to try that picture and that picture. Or you might try cop to change this copy or that copy. Then what Facebook and Google will both do is they'll display um, your ad. So if you've got three versions, they'll display to 33% of your audience this ad, 33% of audience to that ad, 33 to that ad. And then very quickly they'll work out what works and then they'll just start feeding that one ad. Now they may work out that different sort of demographics are um, reacting differently to the different ads, so then they'll feed them like that. So in that context, if you're A-B testing, don't um, do little bits at a time. Don't change the photo and the headline because you can't test. So just change the, the photo. So if you're running a big campaign, you, what I'd recommend is you do a small campaign first and you start testing things. So you might, you do one campaign that's testing three different images. Another small campaign that's testing the three different headlines. Another campaign that's da da da, -da. And then once you've got the perfect ad, then you can run it. So the holy grail of digital marketers in a commercial context is where they've worked out the cost per acquisition is less than the profit they make from paying for the marketing and that that ad performs. So they just keep paying for that ad forever. Well, for years at a time. And so it just is done and it automates. So um, it's really important to uh, test. So A-B testing also on a website. So Divi, the software I used uh, to build WordPress websites has an A-B tester built in. There's various plugins and um, the various website software now has A-B testing. So if you're testing landing pages, you can go, right, well, I'm going to um, test to 50% of my audience, um, this, this option and that option. Now, if you don't have any fancy technology, you might just go, okay, well, I'm going to run it for three days on this page. I'm going to change it, run it for three days on this one, adjust the stats to, to roughly the equal traffic spent to each one and work out which one worked the best. Um, so it's really important that you're trying to test. Okay, heat mapping. Um, heat mapping is a technology, um, there's various plugins that you can plug in um, where it um, overlays your website, so therefore you can um, overlays your website, so then you can actually see where people are clicking and looking and those sort of things. Um, they can be useful. They generally um, drain resources on your website and make your website a little bit slower to download. So if you are using any sort of heat mapping technology, just run it for a bit and just see how you're going. Now, if you're a small organization, you just won't have the traffic to be able to run any of these this testing. Um, you just won't have enough of a small sample group to be able to test your A-B testing. But you can still do it. So for example, when we were um, at the lead, we, um, we understood that Twitter is a medium where you could just shoot out as many posts as you want, as you, you can. Whereas Facebook works better if you're having one post per day. 
So what we'd do is we'd make some memes um, on the various thing that we're doing. Um, in, in this one case, um, we're doing, we wanted people to call up the local water minister. And so we, we'd make um, multiple memes and we'll shoot them out to Twitter and then we'd see which one's got the most shares and the most comments. Then that, that successful meme would then go into as a Facebook post and be pushed out to Facebook. So in that, in that context, um, some weird stuff happens. So for example, we, we had this one um, where um, we'd run out of ideas, we had two ideas. So we just did this really cheesy one. I, was, I, I had a picture of a pipeline. I said, I'll get on the line, ring Peru. And it was just this real dumb, cheesy meme. Um, it got heaps of traffic. Um, and we're like, oh, that's weird, cool. So then that went into the Facebook and away it went. Um, so even if you get low traffic or you're just a small org, you can be creative with your A-B testing. And the final um, point about data improvement is talking a little bit about offline data measurement. So just say you're spending money on a radio ad or if you're spending or you're getting in a newspaper or posters or whatever. There's two ways of tracking that. One on a commercial context is a coupon code. So, so you know, your poster is 10% off, put this code in, and then um, you can see how many people um, bought a product with that code that came from the poster. Um, another way of, looked, of doing that is um, just setting up a custom page. So for example, many years ago, there was this thing called Green Pages. It was like Yellow Pages, but for um, sustainable organizations. And I did a year's advertising with them. And I, um, like an ad in the, in the green pages, and I put forward slash my website, forward slash green pages was the URL. And um, that way I could use my Google Analytics to see how many, how much traffic came to that page. And then the next year they rang me up and said, look, do you want to advertise? I looked up the stats and went, no, no one came to my webpage. Now it could have been my ad was bad and didn't convert, but I, I also reckon the medium just was irrelevant. And so I said, no, I'm not advertising. So that way you can start tracking what, what is coming offline, that sort of thing. Do we have any questions? Um, oh, there are, so I'm just looking up, is it worthwhile having a website, community group, Facebook page and community Facebook group? Um, it's all about your strategy. Um, I'm not going to answer that with a yes or a no. I'll answer that with you. Um, you need to look at your target audience, what you're trying to achieve, what's the best platforms to engage with, with the resources you have. Okay, so um, thank you for coming to the webinar. Uh, on the email that I sent out, I've got in the footer um, various ways that you can support me. Um, so I got two donations today. So that makes me dance. I get really excited, but um, it's not all about the money. So um, if you leave a, um, if you just share these webinars, that's really exciting for me. Um, or if you um, put a put a review on our Facebook page or anything like that. So it's really appreciative um, to support us, um, and that allows me to keep giving away free content for not for profit since run events and that sort of stuff.